Welcome to Target Market Insights, the multifamily and marketing podcast. Each week, John Kasman interviews multifamily and marketing experts to teach you how to find the best places to invest, attract investors, and grow your portfolio. You are listening to Target Market Insights with your host, John Kasman. Welcome to Target Market Insights. I'm your host, John Kasman, and I want to thank you for joining us for another great episode. Now, if you're getting great value out of this show, do me a favor. Leave us a five-star rating and review so you don't miss an episode, and make sure you hit the subscribe button. Now, today we're going to be talking to Anthony Chara. Anthony is a seasoned real estate investor that has successfully invested and managed property and has experience dating back to 1993. Mr. Chara turned to apartments full-time in 2004 and currently owns or has syndicated over 1,800 apartment units with a total asset value in excess of $43 million, ranging from 31 units in Pennsylvania to 410 units for for property portfolios in Indianapolis. He is the managing partner of Apartment Mentors and founder of Success Classes. During the past 20 years, he has owned or managed several successful multi-million dollar companies as well. Let's welcome to the show, Anthony Chara. Hey, John. Thanks for inviting me today. Absolutely, Anthony. Thank you for coming on the show. You have such a wealth of experience, and I know I've personally met some of your mentees that you've worked with and people that you've helped in the industry. You have so much experience, which is something rare. You know, most of the people we talk to, especially when it comes to apartment syndication, are newer operators. You kind of go back a couple of decades. Can you take us back on the clock a little bit about uh, when you started getting into real estate and in particular multifamily? And what was it that kind of sparked and grabbed your attention? Sure. So I actually started investing way back in 1993. I was what you would call an accidental investor. My wife and I decided to turn our first property into a rental and then move into a larger, nicer home. And we did that. But for basically 10 years, all we knew was buy and hold. We didn't know you could do wholesaling, fixing and flipping or anything else. In the early 2000s, I went to a Robert Allen convention, learned that you could do wholesaling, fixing and flipping, foreclosures, uh, apartment buildings and all kinds of other stuff. Paid him a lot of money and made a lot of good money in return. Matter of fact, our very first deal that my wife and I did, we tripled the amount of money that we paid Robert Allen. So it was definitely worth the investment. And then uh, one of the things that I did is after I learned everything from the class, like I would take a wholesaling class and I would go out and I would do some wholesaling deals and I would do fix and flips and I would go out and do some fix flip, fix and flip deals and did apartments and apartments stuck. The other ones to me were too much like a job. That was one of those things where you went out, you did some work and if you did it right, you got paid a lot of money and if you didn't do it right, you didn't get paid a lot of money or you spent a lot of time doing it with not a lot of reward. And when we did our first apartment complex, it turned out that I I liked the checks that were coming in. It was very similar to what I was already doing with single family homes, but it was on a much grander scale. Instead of doing one unit at a time, we did 14 and then we immediately jumped to 98 and then 120 and 140 and 150 and uh, all kinds of numbers in between. So uh, I started doing that pretty much full time in about 2004. Liked it so much that in 2006, decided to start teaching classes. So I partnered up with another person, a guy guy named George, and we started going out and buying apartment buildings. And then not only buying apartment buildings, but also teaching other people how to do what we were doing. And just love doing it, been doing it ever since. That's awesome. So 2004, you basically quit, go full time, you're investing in apartment buildings. You, You talked about, you know, kind of starting small, then working your way up to those 100 unit properties and doing Mm -hmm. that kind of consistently, and then transitioning into the education and helping other people. What was it about the success that you were having, where you felt so inspired to teach other people how to emulate that success? Well, quite frankly, it was when we first started teaching, it was strictly for selfish reasons. And here were the two selfish reasons. Number one was back then in 2004, 2005, when we got into the apartment side of investing, it was also when real estate was extremely hot all over the country. So the first reason we started teaching the classes was because we saw the success other people were having teaching classes and creating home study courses and things like that. And we wanted to add an additional stream of income to our bank account. So that was one of the reasons we started. The other reason, main reason that we started was because we knew that in order to get where we wanted to go, we our, our pockets were not bottomless. We needed to have another, uh, other money available to us in order to get bigger projects and get more projects. 
So as a part of or an offshoot of teaching those classes, it was also about teaching other people our strategy and how we look to analyze and buy apartments and then seeing if some of those people either A, wanted to invest with us or B, if they went out and found a property that met one of our criteria, maybe we would partner with them and put together a syndication. So that's how we got started back in 2006. But, you know, nowadays I just, I keep doing it because I love doing it. I love traveling the country and teaching other people how to be successful and in investing in real estate. And I also like the other perks that all the travel does, uh, gives to me because uh, as I tell people, life is way too short and everybody has their own internal hourglass and most people never know when that hourglass is going to empty. So why are you sitting around waiting for retirement and why are you waiting for the right scenario to happen? You need to take action. You need to take it now. So if you're not happy with what you're doing and, and you think you're going to do all this stuff when you're in retirement, you might want to think again, because there's a lot of people that I know that either A, never made it to retirement or B, by the time they got there, they had so many health issues that they couldn't go out and do what they had always dreamed of doing. So my wife and I decided in 97 to stop waiting and to create our own life and our own path. Uh, Cause most people, what they do is they get a job and then their life revolves around their job, right? All their travel and everything that they do is based on that particular job. What we decided in 97 was to create the life we wanted and then have our business revolve around that. So that's where real estate fit nicely because real estate is everywhere. So we can travel and visit properties, buy properties, analyze properties and do it anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world. Yeah, I love what you just said there, right? We talked about in 97, you made that decision along with your wife to really focus on the lifestyle you wanted, make the business revolve around that versus the other way around, which is the issue yep. that most people have, right? Most people who are working their jobs, and I don't care if you love your job, you still are really kind of handcuffed to that W-2 to go to work, work the nine to five or whatever the hours are, travel as needed, and be, really revol have your life revolve around that that business, you know, that's the challenge that we had, you know, I was, you know, thriving kind of in the, the marketing space. But for me, that moment for me was really when I missed my son's fourth birthday, you know, he turned four yep. years old and I had to go on set to a production, a shoot that we were doing. So they FaceTime me and I, I was just miserable. I was miserable on set that I missed my son's birthday because for me, I said, you know, success for me was really about being able to pick and choose my time prioritizing my time with my young kids and here I am on set for production for something I really don't care about that won't matter in the grand scheme of things and I'm missing a moment that is kind of critical for my family so at that moment I, I really I was already down the path but at that moment I said let's throw some gasoline on this fire and let's go <laughs> yeah. um, but to your point right and I, and I know you talk to a lot of people who are thinking about this lifestyle design, or maybe they're thinking about retirement and just living the life they want in retirement. And there are always some drawbacks, right? There's, there's never the right time to just leap forward and move forward. But I know from you traveling the country, talking to so many people, you probably hear similar, whether you want to call them reasons or excuses or limiting beliefs, um, you probably hear similar things from people what are some of those top reasons that people tell you, hey, I'd love to invest or I'd love to do more in real estate, mm -hmm. but I can't just do it now because of why? The main reason is because of their job. They're so tied into their job that they can't let go. And what they don't realize is that they're actually a slave to their job. I mean, literally, that's what it is because they're living paycheck to paycheck. They don't have a plan in place to set money aside to do what they want to do. Uh, and unfortunately, they're not, what, not that they say this, but what I'm hearing is that they're not disciplined enough to do that. A lot of people, when they get better jobs and higher paychecks, what they do is they then elevate their standard of living. They go out and they buy a bigger, more expensive house. They buy a, a more expensive car or a nicer car. And what they're doing is they're basically shackling themselves and keeping them from actually doing what they should be doing, which is enjoying life because they're stuck making all these payments to everything else, their house payment, their car payment, and they can't leave their job because if they leave their job, then they lose their stream of income. And if they lose the stream of income, they're not going to be able to afford the house and the car and all the other goodies that they want to have. So a, a big part of that is just being disciplined to have the goals in place and to be able to either set money aside or actually step back a little bit. And instead of thinking about going out and buying that next house, for them to live in, because most people don't realize this, but 
your own house is not necessarily an asset. Certainly it is in the long run, but a true asset actually pays you income. It pays you money. And your own personal house does not do that. Unless, of course, you're running out a floor or a bedroom or something like that, like an Airbnb, then you can actually have some income coming in. But in a lot of cases, you're not. You've got all that money going out to support your lifestyle. What you might want to think about is maybe scaling back a little bit, not getting that new car right away. A lot of people think that they need a new car when in reality, most people want a new car. And if you're disciplined enough to wait and do what you need to do, A, get educated, B, set up your goals to figure out when you're going to do what you need to do and how you're going to get, get there rather than waiting and waiting for the, just like you said, John, the waiting for the right time, there's never going to be a right time. <laughs> At some point, you are going to have to cut the rope and, and get rid of your job, but don't do that until you have all your ducks in a row. Uh, one of the great uh, things that I like about real estate investing or even goal setting is one of the things you have to realize is nobody ever stole second base if they never took their foot off of first base. So at some point you do have to let go of that comfort zone, but you can have your plans in place. It's never going to be a hundred percent comfortable, but at least if you know you have a good safety net behind you with a good savings account or a spouse that maybe they stick with their job while you go out and pursue the dream of real estate investing, whether it's apartments, single family homes, whatever that case might be, there's a way to get it done, but you have to set up your goals first and, and yeah, take action I mean, on it and be disciplined. I mean, I think to your point, it's a combination of discipline and then a sacrifice, right? You have to be willing to sacrifice that new car or that bigger house for the yeah. lifestyle you really want to create. I mean, it's prioritizing your priorities. If something is important to you, then you need to make it important. You need to do whatever it takes to make that thing a priority. And sometimes that means stepping back and holding back and saving more money or starting to put that plan in place. How do you start to create yeah. passive income? How do you offset that W-2 income and slowly start to replace that, whether that's through real estate or other means, you know? Um, and, and I would tell you now in 2019, almost 2020, um, this is the perfect time. I mean, you've got the gig economy, where if you have knowledge on a specific topic, you can go online, create a course and sell that knowledge. You can freelance and go on Upwork or some of these websites and sell that. So if you're an accountant or you're a marketer or any of these other type of industries or business industries, you can take that same knowledge and get compensated for it on your own terms. So there's no better time than now to step back and just be creative to say, you don't necessarily need your job, you need the income from the job. So how else could you get that income? And real estate obviously is one of the main ways to do that. So Anthony, you travel all across the country, right? We just talked yep. about that. Um, from a coast real to estate coast. investing standpoint, you know, you are, I mean, you're invested in a ton of, a ton of different markets. How do you go through a market, really take a look and decide where you want to invest, what kind of data are you looking for? What kind of insights are you looking for? What do you look for when you travel across a market and decide you're going to make an investment there? Sure. Well, nowadays, a lot of times the deals are brought to me by my students because they come to different classes and then they go out and they, they find stuff and they bring it to me and they want to know, hey, is this a good deal? What do you think? And I'll take a look at it. But one of the first things that I ask them about is what's going on in their market. First off, why did they pick that particular market? In some cases, it could be as simple as that's their backyard. That's where they live. So that's why they wanted to invest there, which is fine. It's a great way to start. Another reason could be because they like me and you, they want to travel. So what they do is they maybe find a location where they have some relatives. Or if you're in a snowy area like Cincinnati and you don't want to be there in January when it gets really cold, or where I live in Denver, you start buying properties in warmer locations. And that's one of the reasons you want to buy in those locations is, or at least why you start looking is because it gives you an excuse to get out of your home market and take a business trip down to go check out your property. Um, and quick side tangent, that's one of the reasons I love being in business. So a lot of people don't realize this, but when you have a W-2 job, you make your wages. And then the first thing that happens is the government takes your takes taxes out and then you live off what's left over. The nice part about doing what I do and hopefully what you're doing, John, is you start a business and by starting a business, now what you do is you pay all of your expenses first and then you're only taxed on what's left over. 
So it's a much better model. As a matter of fact, if you look at the IRS tax code, it favors two main categories, people that start their own businesses and investors, people that invest in real estate, stocks, things like that. Uh, and even, um, uh, sorry, stocks, real estate, and small businesses, or even large businesses. So take a look at where you're at now. If you're tired of working for somebody else, maybe see if you can start up a small business because now you can start taking those wages or paying your expenses first and then pay taxes on what's left over. But make sure you get educated and talk to your CPA because you need to make sure you're doing it right. You need to make sure that you're following the IRS guidelines because it's not, as, it's not like you're going to be going out and paying your own personal phone bill or your electricity bill in your house and things like that. Don't do that because that'll get you in trouble. But talk to your CPA, follow the guidelines. Okay, back to the market. So once the deal comes, the one, one of the things that I look for, a couple of things that I look for is number one, I want to find out what kind of crime is in the area. And there's a couple websites that I go to. I go to, to spotcrime.com. I go to crimereports.com. I also check out the heat maps on Trulia to see what kind of crimes are in the area. Also, uh, there's another one called, I don't remember the, the name of the site, but it's, I think it's called communitycrimemaps.com. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work in different communities. And I, I hope I have the, the right web address. But you can check all those out. But no matter what comes up on those websites, no matter what, even if it shows absolutely no crime, that usually is an indication that those websites don't interface with the local police department. So what I recommend you do, good or bad, no matter what happens, is you always have to talk to the local police department to find out what kind of crimes in the area. Every single area in the country is going to have crime. The question is, what kind of crimes and how often? So is it what you would call a crime of convenience where somebody was walking by, they see a, a purse or a computer bag or briefcase in the back of somebody's car, they pick up a rock that just happens to be sitting there on the side of the street or in, uh, some landscaping, they smash the window, they grab the bag and they run. That's a crime of opportunity. Then of course you have the ones where somebody walks up to you at a stoplight or a stop sign, taps on your window with the butt of their gun and says, get out of your car, I'm carjacking you. That's a problem, right? So I, I don't want to go into high crime areas or areas that have a, what, what I would call violent crime, a lot of drug activity, or a lot of gang activity. So that's one of the first things I look for. I also want to look at the school districts in the area. Uh, school districts and crime, in most cases, go hand in hand. If you have really good schools, you generally have low crime. If you have really bad schools, you generally have higher crime. So one of the things that I do is on Trulia, I look for areas that have school ratings of at least five or higher. You start getting in the fours and threes and twos. I've actually seen some school districts that have ratings of zero and one. And then I go to the crime websites and sure enough, there's, there's all kinds of crime. And why? Because if kids aren't being educated and they don't see a future for themselves, what do they generally do? A lot of times they end up dropping out of school and then they might join another family like a gang or something like that, or uh, maybe they don't join a gang, but either way, they have to support themselves. They need to be able to feed themselves. So what do they do? They go start stealing stuff or robbing people or things like that to potentially continue to survive. Uh, and, you know, it's not, I don't want to sound like that. this is what happens everywhere, but it's one of the things that can happen when you have uh, low rated school districts because people don't want to stay involved. Um, I also look for employment growth and population growth. Certainly employment growth is what creates the population growth to start with. So I want to see good, positive population growth over the last 10 years or so. Uh, you can go to one of the websites I go to is I go to bestplaces.net. You can also go to census.gov and find out what's happening in your local market. I want to see at least 2% population growth or more within the last couple of years, because that shows that there's a lot of people moving into that market for whatever reason. And when a lot of people move into a market, that means they need housing. Housing then, as vacancies go down, because more people move in, development starts, vacancies go down, rents go up, the value of the properties go up. So that's another thing that I look for. And the other thing that I wanna know, uh, one of the main things is I wanna know in the particular area where I'm looking, not the entire metropolitan area, but as specific as I can, see if I can get my fingers up, but with specific as I can in a very small area around where the property is located, I want to see what the median household income is. And I'm looking for a median household income of at least $45,000 per household, because that way I know people in that area are not necessarily going to be struggling to pay the rent every month. Now, keep in mind that that, that amount, that $45,000 
is relative to the Midwest and the Southeast. If you're going to be buying in downtown Chicago, or you're going to be buying in California or New York or someplace like that, you're going to have to figure out what that median amount of income needs to be per family so that you're not buying in a low income area where everybody every single month is going to be struggling month in and month out to make their, their rental payments. One of the ways that you can find that is through CoStar at C-O-S-T-A-R.com. Uh, they do charge for that information, but one of the other things you can do is in the area where you want to buy, if you start creating a relationship or setting up relationships with real estate agents, commercial real estate agents in your market, a lot of them subscribe to this data, whether it's CoStar, Axiometrics, ALN Data, Reese.com, all of these different sites that have good, good quality data on them. If your broker's already subscribing or maybe their company already has their own data, they'll give you the data for free. But you need to take action. You need to reach out to people in that market and start asking the right questions and creating those relationships. Lots of great information there, right? You started talking about crime, gave us a lot of different resources to look at crime. And again, it, it's kind of common sense, but sometimes we just have to step back and really think through everything logically. But if there's high crime, it's going to be less desirable. You're going to have you know, a, a smaller or a less desirable tenant base to attract from, depending on what your business plan is. If you're going in with a value add business plan and you expect to increase rents, well, it's going to be hard to attract the new tenant that's paying a higher rent if there's a lot of crime and it's a less desirable area. area. So and think, keep, and th yeah. Sorry. And think about the people that are okay living in an area that has high crime. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So you got to factor all those kind of things and schools makes a ton of sense. Uh, there are obviously some exceptions here and there, but schools are definitely a big indication of the desirability of an area. And then to your point, I love your point on focusing in on the sub market and as tight as you can get to the zip code level, but really down to that neighborhood. Because when you start looking at the affordability aspect, and a lot of people make this mistake, where they look at the, the macro area, or they look at a larger region of the area, and they say, hey, we're going to do this, and we're going to crank rents up 200 bucks, but they don't know what that affordability metric is. And in some of these areas, people can't afford to pay another 200 bucks. Yep. So you're just going to lose them, and you're going to create a product yep. that people can't afford. So you're either going to have to drop your rents and take the hit, or you're going to loosen up your, your lending or your, uh, your renter requirements, and maybe you're not accepting people that you otherwise wouldn't want to accept. So you definitely want to make sure you understand what those numbers are and the threshold and looking at the average household income uh, is a good way to just identify that, Hey, this renter lives here and they make this kind of money. They can afford this. Yeah. Um, we just need to give them the right product. So great points there, Anthony, as yeah, you look across the, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. So I was going to say, and you're right. You, there are some areas around the country where you can fix up your, your properties and put in granite countertops and stainless steel appliances and all kinds of stuff. But if people in that area can only afford a certain amount of rent, you're throwing good money after bad. You're not going to be able to raise the rent. I actually had a, a couple students I was coaching about six months ago. They were looking in a, a really obscure area in Indiana and looking at a property and they're like, wow, we can raise the rents two to $200 a month. And I said, well, based on what, how do you figure that, that you can raise the rent $200 a month? They said, well, because we found these comparables. Well, the comparables were three miles away. And it's like, no, 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 that's, that's way too far away for this particular property. And the com only comparables they could find were, were pretty much single family homes or duplexes or something like that, not an apartment building. So what I did is I tasked them and I said, you need to go back and find real estate, bro uh, real estate property managers in that area that will actually manage a property in that area and find out what they would actually charge, what they think the going rate is. And they did that. They came back and found out that the going rate was exactly what the apartment was already charging. And there's no way they were going to be able to raise the rent $200 a month because they were using faulty data. Mm, great so points you're, there. You're and, right. And you have to zone and, in and, on, on your market. And what you just said is a great tip too, right? So if you are unsure of what you can get, find a local property manager. Who would be the person who's going to manage the property? Ask them. You need to talk to them and get it verified. You don't want to just go off the numbers you put into your spreadsheet, but no. find that local <laughs> property manager because they're going to be the ones who are most accountable to actually delivering on it. So they're going to know whether or not it's realistic, especially based on the condition of the units and the finishes you plan on uh, selecting, yeah. whether or not you can achieve those kind of rents. So great points there, Anthony.
And you need to talk to multiple property managers too. Don't just make the mistake of talking to one who tells you what you want to hear. I would recommend you talk to at least three, a minimum of three that will actually manage that type of property in that market and, and find out from them what they think they can get for rent as the property sits or if you were to do some upgrades and depending on what those upgrades are, you can do a medium style, up, a low upgrade, a medium upgrade or a, a full upgrade to some high end stuff and find out what they think it would be worth if they think that you should even do any of the work so sometimes your value play comes in with just taking a property the way it is right now and raising the rents because some owners haven't raised rents in a while. Matter of fact, I met one a couple of years ago, hadn't raised the rent in four years because they didn't want people moving out. Well, they were 200 to $300 behind every month on their rental payments. Mm. Or not, I'm sorry, not on the rental payments, but 200 $300 low on every single unit that they owned. Well, that's ridiculous because they, they just didn't want people moving out. And I said, do you realize you're paying people two to $300 a month to stay in your property because you don't want them to move out so that you have to go in and paint it or put in new carpet or something like that. That's ridiculous because a two to $300 a month raise, uh, you, can, you can recoup most of your money in the first year. And then of course, everything after that is gravy. And you also increase the value of your property too. Yeah, absolutely. Good tips there. So Anthony, you're all over the country. Which markets are you really gravitating to? And I know you're open to multiple markets, but which yep. ones really bubble up to the top? So one of the things that I do is I'll do research every couple of months and I'll just Google things like hot real estate markets, um, hot employment markets, uh, good economic markets, things like that, and see what comes up. And what I'm looking for is consistency between the markets. A couple of the markets right now that are doing really well, uh, Orlando's one that's doing extremely well. Uh, even Tampa, St. Pete is doing well, but it's not doing as well as Orlando because it doesn't have all the hospitality and stuff and all, all the other things that, that people bring people to Orlando. Uh, quite frankly, even West Detroit is doing extremely well in the northern suburbs of Detroit. Detroit city, city is still having some issues, but there's a lot of areas around there that have, that have gone like gangbusters over the last couple of years. As a matter of fact, uh, the city of Detroit filed for bankruptcy in 2014. And shortly thereafter, the market started to boom because they got rid of all their past debt and all their things that were weighing them back. And a lot of developers started coming in and putting in a lot of new projects. And again, in West Detroit, where a lot of people were moving up to the suburbs north of Detroit. Uh, and it's just an incredibly hot market. For years and years and years, I remember a bunch of people wanting to invest in Detroit because you could literally go down the street and buy a house with a credit card. For 1000 or $5,000, you could buy a whole house. Well, that's great, but you also had people who were living in that area who were living in $5,000 houses, and these weren't big mansions, and they were living there because that's all they could afford. And a lot of these people ended up losing their houses anyway because the people weren't taking care of them or they'd move out in the middle of the month because they just couldn't even afford the low rent. So you do have to be careful. But uh, again, West Detroit, Northern, Northern Detroit uh, area uh, up around Troy and things like that are doing very well. Orlando, um, uh, let's see, Dallas is still doing really well, even though it's, it's slowing down a little bit. Uh, I, I like a lot of stuff in the Midwest. I like um, Omaha. Um, Kansas City, I think, is, uh, might be a little bit tapped out. Uh, both on the Kansas side and the Missouri side, but there's potential there for growth as well. Uh, it just depends on whether or not some of the projects that I've been reading about are going to be coming in or not. Uh, the other thing it too is you have to be, as you mentioned earlier, John, you have to be very careful about the sub market. As I mentioned, even things like Orlando, Orlando might be a great market to invest, but that doesn't mean the entire city is a great place to invest. You have to know where in the market is the best place to go rather than just Orlando. Uh, and you find some of those things out by talking to the people who live there and know that particular market the best. And they can tell you areas that you should invest in and areas that you should avoid. Um, let's see what else. Uh, Denver's slowing down a little bit. It's been going like gangbusters for 10 years now. And a lot of people didn't realize this, but the recession ended in 2009. And that's when real estate actually started taking off on a lot of major markets like Denver and Dallas and a few other areas around the country. But we didn't really feel it until 2012. Well, things are now slowing down. They're still going well and things are still improving uh, or increasing. In other words, occupancy still, uh, occupancy has actually slowed down a little bit, but rental rates are still going up. Uh, and unfortunately, it, 
for you as a new investor, if, you, if you're not already in the market, now may not be a good time to get into Denver or Dallas. Uh, and, and there's two sides to that. There are some people that think that in 2020, the economy is going to take a breath. So it's going to slow down a little bit, kind of catch its breath, and then it's going to take off for a little bit longer. There's other people that think it's going to slow down in, in 2020, and it might be just as bad or worse than what happened in 2006 to 2009. So time will tell. Unfortunately, if we had a crystal ball, we'd all be doing whatever the crystal ball tells us to do. Uh, so again, the other thing I would recommend is, uh, I know Grand Rapids is another good market. Uh, I was going to say recommend it. Do the Google searches and look for consistency. Grand Rapids is coming up on a bunch of lists. Colorado Springs is coming up on a bunch of lists. So there's reason people are gravitating to those areas. Usually it's because of job creation. No, great points there. And using the Google searches, checking out the best places and seeing the different lists. And then going back to even what you started with, you know, you know, it's great to identify the best market in the country. But if you have no competitive advantage in Orlando, if you have no team in Orlando to go out there and think you're going to compete with everyone else who is, you know, has the infrastructure, the teams in place, they're building the broker relationships, and you're just sending an email every once in a while. It's probably not the best approach. So you should also look in your backyard or places where you're more naturally going to have relationships where you're going to travel. Uh, but and then if you're investing passively, by all means, you can pick and choose where, where you want to go. But if you are going to be the active investor, you definitely want to make sure that you have some competitive advantage so you can find a good deal in those markets. Um, Absolutely. Anthony, I want to talk to you now about just kind of coaching, right? Because you've had so many great students come under your wings over the last, you know, what, 13, 14 years or so. And you've been able to identify how to help people, the best way to coach. Um, what do you see when you're working with students? How do you know, or do you know from the moment you meet them or the, the moment you take on a student, whether or not they're going to have success? And what are some different tips and tricks you've learned that for yourself to be a better coach for some of these students? Sure. Um, and, uh, uh, I have not found that that perfect scenario yet to be able to talk to somebody and figure out whether or not they're they're going to be successful or not. I think a lot of it comes down to the person individually and whether or not a they're willing to do what their coach tells them to do, and b just taking action. Uh, there occasionally there are students that are rah 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 they're ready to go, and then I'll check in with them in a month or so after they sign up, and it's like, hey, what's happening? What's going on? Like, well, I got busy, my my job, this, my family, that, and they haven't been able to do the research that they wanted to do on a particular market, and you know I can't make people get back into it and can't make them get reengaged. All I can do is give them the tools. It's up to them to use the tools. So I'll go back to them and say, look, you need to stay focused. And what can you do? If, if you can only spend 15 minutes a day, go do this. 15 minutes a day, go research a market, go look for properties, call and, and talk to property managers, or call real estate agents in that particular area. Start creating those relationships. And, and for 15 minutes a day, that shouldn't be a problem. But for some people, they just don't put it on their calendar. They don't stay focused. And they need to do that. So, uh, you know, the biggest things are, as we talked about at the very beginning of this podcast, right? It's about creating your goals and sticking with them and seeing everything through to fruition. If you don't start writing things down and going step by step and deciding this is what I'm going to do today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, you're going to lose focus and you're never going to take action. So set up your goals, be coachable. And even if time is difficult for you right now because of your job, because of your family, because of health issues, whatever that case might be, literally all you have to do is set aside 15 to 30 minutes a day to start taking action and you will see success. No, I love it. Good tips there. 15 minutes a day. Obviously, if you could do more, that's even better. But at a minimum, I think we all can commit to 15 minutes a day. And this isn't just for Anthony and his students. I would say anybody listening to this, you're listening because you're interested in being a better real estate investor or creating a different lifestyle, improving your lifestyle for yourself and your family. So think about what you can do. What is the most important thing you can do every day for 15 minutes, a half an hour to take steps in that right direction? So really great tips there. Anthony, I'm ready to move on to the bullseye round. Are you ready? Uh, sure. <laughs> I don't know if I should tell you to take your, <laughs> take your best shot with the bullseye round. I'm yeah. not quite sure what the bullseye <laughs> round is, but okay, let's go. <laughs> All right. 
How has a failure or parent failure set you up for later success? Oh, great question. So I'll tell you right now, there's nothing that educates you more than failure. And I've had a few of them. As, as I tell my students, my wife and I have failed hundreds of thousands of dollars of times. <laughs> and you, you learn from it. And one of the biggest things that we learned is to not give up. Literally, there's a lot of people, they have one setback and that one setback just completely takes them out of the game. And they're like, I, I'm not gonna do this. I'm not gonna do real estate investing. I'm not gonna do X, Y, or Z, whatever it is that you wanna do because of that one failure. Failure is what teaches you the most value. That's, that's where you actually get your best education. So uh, failures are one of those things that when they first hit and you first have a couple of them, certainly you're not happy about it, but for crying out loud, learn from it, put it in the back of your mind and move forward and, and continue to take action. What is the book you've recommended or gifted the most in the last year? Well, I've got a few of them. So one of course is uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad uh, uh, from Robert Kiyosaki along with Cashflow Quadrant. Another one I like is The Science of Getting Rich and also Think and Grow Rich. So all of those, those four books there are probably the number one, uh, number one through four and in a variety of different circumstances that I would recommend that, that people read and or I've gifted to people. I actually have some of them on uh, my computer. So if somebody sends me an email, all I have to do is say, yep, yeah, here's a copy for you to read and good luck, you know, go for it. All right, give me a digital or mobile resource you recommend for your business. A digital or mobile resource. Um, can you be more specific? Something that I yeah. use is for there, my business? Is there, an, is there an application that you use, like a digital app uh, application? Is there something on your phone that you use for your team, for communication, for finding deals or anything like that? Yeah, I'm still an old school kind of guy. So even though I have apps on my phone, I, I really don't use my phone other than, than texting and checking emails and that kind of stuff on my phone. Uh, most of the stuff that I do, most of my resources are right on my computer. Uh, I certainly I, I've got 110 different websites that I actually recommend to people. So most of that stuff is on there. There isn't one in particular that I would recommend people go to. Uh, but again, that's why I have 110. And that's why there's millions and millions of websites out there. Because depending on what you're looking for, and what you find on a particular website or how it's laid out determines whether or not people think it's a, a popular website for them to continue to use. What's a daily habit that helps you stay focused on your goals? Well, one of the daily habits is to read my goals twice a day out loud with emotion. So rather than just writing down the goals, it's about reading them twice a day. And one of the things I do is I'll post them on the mirror in my bathroom because generally it's the first thing I'm going to see when I wake up and the last thing I'm going to see before I go to sleep. And I can read them out loud and again with emotion. So uh, it's something about, somebody taught me this years ago, it's something about when you talk either loudly or with emotion or yell it or whatever, the vibrations that hit your body actually ingrain those, uh, those goals into your actual soul and act, your actual being. And, and it worked out great for us. I also um, like doing vision boards as well. So I, I not only write the goals, but I also do the vision boards so that I can see my dreams as well. What's one thing you know now that you wish you knew when you were starting out? I wish I had invested in apartments a lot sooner. Uh, I spent a lot of money on down payments for single family homes to make a whopping 100, 200, $300 a month in cash flow. Well, I could have taken that same amount of money and put it into an apartment complex and have exponentially multiplied my net worth and my cash flow over the years. What's one thing you know now that you wish you knew 12 months ago? Hmm, that my wife is a klutz? Um, <laughs> no, I say that jokingly, but uh, we were actually on a trip, uh, matter of fact, about, about a month and a half, two months ago, and uh, we were going on a hike and she lost her balance and fell over. <clears throat> and uh, uh, we can laugh about it now, but it was pretty serious back then. She actually knocked herself unconscious and broke her wrist. Oh, wow. uh, so yeah, of course, I probably did know that 12 months ago and I just ignored it because I just put it up to, well, that's just my wife being my wife. So 12 months ago, hmm, uh, let's see. Yeah, other than that, I would have to think about that one. Something that, I, that I've learned within the last 12 months. There, there's a lot of stuff that we already know but we just don't, we, what's the old saying? You, you don't know what you don't know. 
but then there's things that you know but you don't really know them in your subconscious i guess mm -hmm. so yeah there's there's a there's a quote that uh there's another gentleman he, he likes to say it you know it but are you implementing it ah uh, so there's yeah. the other part is like there's things that we know but we haven't actually done it so even like i'm listening to you talking about uh, you know, those affirmations, right? Just writing down those affirmations, the daily goals, saying them out loud twice a day with emotion, with energy, yelling them. So that's something that, again, I don't know how many people are actually doing that. You may have heard it. If you listen to the show often, you've heard other guests saying that, but are you implementing it? You yeah. know, if that's something that you're looking to do, even journaling, things like that, if you're looking for time, there's ways to create time. We just have to take these little, they seem small and insignificant, but they are really important steps, especially that vision board, things of that nature to really crystallize your vision for the life you want to create. So um, that's another great step there. Yeah. Um, what are you curious about right now? Well, I'm actually curious about investing in things other than real estate. So one of the things that I'm going to be doing next week with my wife is we're heading down to the country of Paraguay which is down in central South America. So if you look at a, a map of South America, it's pretty much right smack dab in the middle of it to possibly invest in orange groves. So people need to eat, people need places to sleep. So I'm very interested in investing in food. Matter of fact, we've got some other investments we're looking into next year, both in, um, uh, I know one is in the country of Belize. So there's a, there's a, a chocolate uh, plantation that's getting set up in uh, Belize and then it's either Costa Rica or Panama I don't remember which one uh, the same company that does the chocolate in Belize is also doing coffee in one of those countries and they're setting up coffee farms or whatever they're called <clears throat> um, and, and growing new plants and, and helping the economy down there and helping the people and then hey we benefit because we get a return on our investment and it, it, it's something that between chocolate I mean who doesn't there's very few people that don't eat chocolate, very few people that don't drink coffee. A lot of people eat citrus fruit, right? Real fruit, oranges and stuff like that. And if you're not eating live food, then you don't know what you're missing because live food is much better for you than the dead food. Um, so those are the other things that I'm doing. Anthony, I love it. Speaking of food, give me the best place to grab a bite out in Denver. Ooh, the best place to grab a bite. Well, if you like Italian food, there's a place in South Denver called Mama Roma's on Quebec and um, Quebec and County Line. I love their their food there. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Indian food. Uh, there used to be a place here called Gandhi. Unfortunately, they closed up shop because somebody came in and bought up that whole area and did a, a huge redevelopment. And of course, if you like a good steak, hey, who doesn't know John Elway? You can go to Elway Steakhouse and get a really good steak. Excellent. Anthony, so much great information. Love hearing your story about how you made the transition, starting to invest in real estate, how that just took over your life and allowed you to create a lifestyle by design where you built a life around what you wanted to do and let the business kind of wrap around that versus the other way around. And yep. all the students that you've helped over the years and giving us the tips of how you navigate the country, where you find the best places to invest, the kind of questions you ask, when you're looking at deals and investment opportunities, just really giving us the knowledge of what it takes to continue to progress and move forward. How can our listeners get in touch with you if they want to learn more? Well, you can get in touch with me a couple different ways. My website is successclasses.com. That is plural, successclasses.com. Or you can send an email to me at anthony at successclasses.com, anthony at successclasses.com. Anthony, thank you again for coming on the show today and sharing so much knowledge with us. We look forward to staying in touch and we'll talk to you again soon. Well, thanks, John. I appreciate you having me and I hope everybody has a great day.